The Real History of Slavery Slavery was an evil of greater scope and magnitude than most people imagine, and, as a result, its place in history is radically different from the way it is usually portrayed. Mention slavery, and immediately the image that arises is that of Africans and their descendants enslaved by Europeans and their descendants in the southern United States, or at most, Africans enslaved by Europeans in the Western Hemisphere. No other historic horror is so narrowly construed. No one thinks of war, famine, or decimating epidemics in such localized terms. These are afflictions that have been suffered by the entire human race all over the planet, and so was slavery. Had slavery been limited to one race in one country during three centuries, its tragedies would not have been one-tenth the magnitude that they were in fact. Why this provincial view of a worldwide evil? Often, it is those who are most critical of a Eurocentric view of the world who are most Eurocentric when it comes to the evils and failings of the human race. Why would anyone wish to arbitrarily understate an evil that plagued mankind for thousands of years? unless it was not this evil itself that was the real concern, but rather the present-day uses of that historic evil. Clearly, the ability to score ideological points against American society or Western civilization, or to induce guilt and thereby extract benefits from the white population today, are greatly enhanced by making enslavement appear to be a peculiarly American or a peculiarly white crime. This explanation is also consistent with the otherwise inexplicable contrast between the fiery rhetoric about past slavery in the United States, used by those who pass over in utter silence the traumas of slavery that still exist in Mauritania, the Sudan, and parts of Nigeria and Benin. Why so much more concern for dead people who are now beyond our help than for living human beings suffering the burdens and humiliations of slavery today? Why does a verbal picture of the abuses of slaves in centuries past arouse far more response than contemporary photographs of present-day slaves in Time magazine, the New York Times, or the National Geographic? It takes no more research than a trip to almost any public library or college library to show the incredibly lopsided coverage of slavery in the United States or in the Western Hemisphere as compared to the meager writings on the even larger number of Africans enslaved in the Islamic countries of the Middle East and North Africa, not to mention the vast numbers of Europeans also enslaved in centuries past in the Islamic world and within Europe itself. At least a million Europeans were enslaved by North African pirates alone from 1500 to 1800 and some European slaves were still being sold on the auction block in Egypt, years after the Emancipation Proclamation freed blacks in the United States. Indeed, an Anglo-Egyptian treaty of August 4, 1877, prohibited the continued sale of white slaves after August 3, 1885, as well as prohibiting the import and export of Sudanese and Abyssinian slaves. During the Middle Ages, Slavs were so widely used as slaves in both Europe and the Islamic world that the very word slave derived from the word for Slav, not only in English, but also in other European languages, as well as in Arabic. Nor have Asians or Polynesians been exempt from either being enslaved or enslaving others. China, in centuries past, has been described as one of the largest and most comprehensive markets for the exchange of human beings in the world. Slavery was also common in India, where it has been estimated that there were more slaves than in the entire Western Hemisphere, and where the original thugs kidnapped children for the purpose of enslavement. In some of the cities of Southeast Asia, slaves were a majority of the population. Slavery was also an established institution in the Western Hemisphere, before Columbus's ships ever appeared on the horizon. The Ottoman Empire regularly enslaved a percentage of the young boys from the Balkans, converted them to Islam, and assigned them to various duties in the civil or military establishment. Race and Slavery The instrumental use of the history of slavery today also underlies the claim that slavery grew out of racism. For most of its long history, which includes most of the history of the human race, slavery was largely not the enslavement of racially different people, for the simple reason that only in recent centuries has either the technology or the wealth existed to go to another continent to get slaves and transport them en masse across an ocean. 
People were enslaved because they were vulnerable, not because of how they looked. The peoples of the Balkans were enslaved by fellow Europeans, as well as by the peoples of the Middle East, for at least six centuries before the first African was brought to the Western Hemisphere. Before the modern era, by and large, Europeans enslaved other Europeans, Asians enslaved other Asians, Africans enslaved other Africans, and the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere enslaved other indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. Slavery was not based on race, much less on theories about race. Only relatively late in history did enslavement across racial lines occur on such a scale as to promote an ideology of racism that outlasted the institution of slavery itself. Wherever a separate people were enslaved, they were disdained or despised, whether they were different by country, religion, caste, race, or tribe. The Europeans who were enslaved in North Africa were despised and abused because they were Christians in a Muslim region of the world, where they were called Christian dogs. Race became the most visible difference between slaves and slave owners in the Western Hemisphere. As distinguished historian Daniel J. Borston put it, now for the first time in Western history, the status of slave coincided with a difference of race. To make racism the driving force behind slavery is to make a historically recent factor the cause of an institution which originated thousands of years earlier. This enshrinement of racism as an overarching causal factor accords far more with current instrumental agendas than with history. The form in which the story of slavery has reached most people today has been along the lines of the best-selling book and widely watched television miniseries, Roots, by Alex Haley. Challenged on the historical accuracy of Roots, Haley said, I tried to give my people a myth to live by. This instrumental use of history, or purported history, is open to the same objections as other instrumental myth-making. First is the objection to falsification itself, that the damage which this does to the general level of understanding and trust in a society is incalculable and can easily outweigh, in its long-run consequences especially, any immediate good that might be expected from an expedient taking of liberties with the truth. Second, even the short-run benefits are by no means clear. Has a sense of special grievance helped advance any people? Or has what happened in centuries past been a distraction and an incitement to counterproductive strife, much as territorial irredentism has been? Rather than debate current ideological agendas, we can try to determine what we can about the actual history of slavery, including how it ended. No institution of comparable age and worldwide scope has ever disappeared over almost the entire planet, leaving so little awareness of how and why it vanished or so little interest in that question. Volumes continue to be published about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which, for all its greatness, did not encompass one-tenth as much of the world as the institution of slavery did. Archaeologists continue to excavate the ruins of ancient civilizations in Central America and the Middle East, while military historians pour through archives and examine ancient weapons to try to piece together the history of warfare. Yet remarkably little is written about one of the most momentous moral dramas in the history of the human species, the bitter worldwide struggle which lasted for more than a century to destroy the elaborate systems and institutions for the ownership and sale of human beings. While there is a sizable literature on the American Civil War, for all its staggering carnage and historic legacy within the United States, in an international perspective, it is only a small and highly atypical part of the story of the worldwide crusade against slavery. No other nation ended slavery in the same way as the United States did, and few ended it after so short a struggle, as history is measured. How and why did slavery end in most of the world? There were two major processes. Over the centuries, as more and more territories around the world consolidated into nation-states with their own armies and navies, Raiding those territories to capture and enslave the people who lived within them became more hazardous in itself and also risked military retaliation against the countries from which the raiders came. Thus, more and more peoples became off-limits to slave raiders over time. Put differently, 
the areas which remained subject to slave raiding over the centuries were primarily those where the people lived in smaller or weaker societies. Such societies continued to exist where it was difficult, for geographic or other reasons, to consolidate large areas under one government. This was true of the Balkans, the backwaters of Asia, and much of sub-Saharan Africa. By the early modern era, sub-Saharan Africa, with its numerous and severe geographic handicaps, was one of the last remaining areas from which vast numbers of people could be enslaved. Far from being targeted by Europeans for racial reasons, as some have claimed, Africa was resorted to as a source of large supplies of slaves only after centuries of Europeans enslaving other Europeans had been brought to an end by the consolidation of nations and empires on the European continent by internal shifts from slavery to serfdom in much of Europe, and by the Catholic Church's pressures against enslaving fellow Christians, which was by no means the same as the Church's saying that slavery, as such, was wrong. Similar consolidations of political units in parts of Asia led to a decline of slavery in those realms. While Africa became the main source of new slaves in later centuries, existing slaves continued to include peoples of many races living in many places around the world. Ending the slavery of all these peoples was a very difficult process and one requiring deliberate and sustained action for many generations. Ironically, the anti-slavery ideology behind this process began to develop in 18th century Britain, at a time when the British Empire led the world in slave trading and when the economy of most of its overseas colonies in the Western Hemisphere depended on slaves. Here again, the baffling present-day disregard of an international saga of strife, full of individual dramas as well as historic consequences, seems explicable only in terms of today's ideological agendas. While slavery was common to all civilizations, as well as to peoples considered uncivilized, only one civilization developed a moral revulsion against it, very late in its history, Western civilization. Today it seems so obvious that, as Abraham Lincoln said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. But the hard fact is that, for thousands of years, slavery was simply not an issue, even among the great religious thinkers or moral philosophers of civilizations around the world. We may wonder why it took 18 centuries after the Sermon on the Mount for Christians to develop an anti-slavery movement. But a more profound question is why not even the leading moralists in other civilizations rejected slavery at all. There is no evidence, according to a scholarly study, that slavery came under serious attack in any part of the world before the 18th century. That is when it first came under attack in Europe. Themselves the leading slave traders of the 18th century, Europeans nevertheless became, in the 19th century, the destroyers of slavery around the world, not just in European societies or European offshoot societies overseas, but in non-European societies as well, over the bitter opposition of Africans, Arabs, Asians, and others. Moreover, within Western civilization, the principal impetus for the abolition of slavery came first from very conservative religious activists, people who would today be called the religious right. Clearly, this story is not politically correct in today's terms. Hence, it is ignored, as if it never happened. Western and Non-Western Societies Slavery did not die out quietly of its own accord. It went down fighting to the bitter end, and it lost only because Europeans had gunpowder weapons first. The advance of European imperialism around the world marked the retreat of the slave trade, and then of slavery itself. The British stamped out slavery, not only throughout the British Empire, which included one-fourth of the world, whether measured in land or people, but also by its pressures and its actions against other nations. For example, the British Navy entered Brazilian waters in 1849 and destroyed Brazilian ships that had been used in the slave trade. The British government pressured the Ottoman Empire into banning the African slave trade and, later, threatened to start boarding Ottoman ships in the Mediterranean if that empire did not do a better job of policing the ban. Still later, Americans stamped out slavery in the Philippines, the Dutch stamped it out in Indonesia, the Russians in Central Asia, the French in their West African and Caribbean colonies, 
Germans in their East Africa colonies often hanged slave traders on the spot when they caught them in the act. No non-Western nation or civilization shared this animosity towards slavery that began to develop in the Western world in the late 18th century, reached its peak in the 19th century, and continued to fuel the anti-slavery efforts that were still necessary in much of Africa and the Middle East on into the first half of the 20th century. This worldwide struggle went on for more than a century because the non-Western world in general resisted and evaded all efforts to get them to root out this institution that was an integral part of their economies and societies. When the British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire first raised the issue of abolishing slavery with the Sultan in 1840, he reported this response. I have been heard with extreme astonishment, accompanied with a smile at a proposition for destroying an institution closely interwoven with the frame of society in this country, and intimately connected with the law and with the habits and even the religion of all classes, from the sultan himself on down to the lowest peasant. Similarly, the Maoris of New Zealand responded to comments on their enslavement of some fellow Polynesians on other islands by saying, We took possession in accordance with our customs, and we caught all the people. Not one escaped. Some ran away from us. These we killed, and others we killed. But what of that? It was in accordance with our customs. When British Foreign Secretary Palmerston sought in 1841, through his representative council, Atkins Hamilton, to get the ruler of Zanzibar to end the flourishing slave trade there, this was the response. When Palmerston continued to press for an end to the slave trade, Said pleaded that if he acceded to British demands, his subjects would withdraw their loyalty from him and support another claimant to the throne. And was he not looked up to by all Arabs generally as the person who should protect and guarantee for them their dearest interest, the right to carry on the slave trade? He reminded Hamerton that Arabs were not like the English and other European people who were always reading and writing and were unable to understand the anti-slavery viewpoint. The British obsession with it was quite inexplicable to them. In short, what was so patently wrong about slavery in the eyes of Western civilization of the past two centuries was almost incomprehensible to many non-Westerners. Eventually, some westernized elites or intellectuals in non-Western societies also became embarrassed about slavery, but these societies developed no such fervent anti-slavery movements as those which propelled successive European and European offshoot societies to ban this practice for themselves and to stamp it out, among others. In the Western world, hostility to slavery was by no means confined to elites. When a British ship stopped at Zanzibar in the 19th century, it was considered dangerous to let British sailors go ashore for fear that they would riot if they saw the slave market there. In the years leading up to the abolition of slavery in Brazil, soldiers and their officers no longer believed in the legitimacy of slavery and so dragged their feet when assigned the task of recapturing runaway slaves. Soldiers continued to be sent to places where slaves were on the loose but were not afraid to express their unwillingness to capture fugitives. The commander of an army unit sent to a community in Sao Paulo early in 1888 agreed to maintain order, but openly declined to capture slaves. In places runaways were loitering on the roads, refusing to work. Army units sent to control them did nothing. Not all Brazilian soldiers refused orders to control or recaptured escaped slaves, but there was enough opposition to this role that a formal request was made to the civil authorities by the military to relieve them of this distasteful duty. With public opinion increasingly hostile to the continuation of slavery and many Brazilians keenly aware of and painfully embarrassed by the fact that their country was the last one in the Western world to still have slavery, the plantation owners were increasingly isolated, and some began freeing their slaves themselves in anticipation of official emancipation, and in some cases in hopes of retaining these workers as employees. Thus, when the official date of emancipation arrived in Brazil, most slaves were already free, either having been freed by plantation owners or having simply left the plantations on their own, secure in the knowledge that the surrounding population was not likely to cooperate in their recapture and return. Still, when the official day of emancipation arrived, it was a cause of national celebration. The novelist Machado de Assis, 
recalled that the celebrations following the passage of the Golden Law were the only instance of popular delirium that I can remember ever having seen. One Sao Paulo newspaper described the crowds that gathered to celebrate. To try to describe the splendor of that festival of joy, to tell everything that happened, falls beyond our abilities. Never has this capital seen such multitudinous and unanimous enthusiasm. Perhaps at no other period of history was the contrast between the Western and the non-Western world greater. Here was the scene when the Ottoman Empire announced the end of the slave trade. In 1855, when the Sultan's Furman was read out in Mecca and Jeddah, it caused a revolution. Turkish officials, including the Qadi, who read the Furman, were murdered, the garrison shut, and Mecca was in a state of revolt until the port repealed the obnoxious order. And when the governor-general of the Hejaz issued orders on 25th February 1860 forbidding the slave trade in all Turkish ports in the Red Sea, there was great excitement and fear of the recurrence of the 1855 violence. There was no Ottoman cruiser in the Red Sea capable of giving effect to this order, and Turkish officials were too frightened to enforce it. Although the slave trade was formally abolished in the Ottoman Empire, under pressure from the British government, slavery itself continued. As of 1891, the Imperial Palace purchased 11 slave girls for its harem, as others in the Ottoman Empire purchased women as concubines, typically white women from a region near the Caucasus and the Black Sea, known as Circassia, even though every nation in the Western world had by then outlawed slavery. Not only the Turks accepted such slavery, so did the Circassians. Mothers often groomed their daughters for this role and sold them into what was considered to be a desirable situation, at least by comparison with what was available in Circassia. British Foreign Secretary Palmerston said, The only complaint we have ever heard from the Circassians has been against our attempts to stop the traffic. Contrary to the myths to live by, created by Alex Haley and others, Africans were by no means the innocents portrayed in roots, baffled as to why white men were coming in and taking their people away in chains. On the contrary, the region of West Africa from which Kunta Kinte supposedly came was one of the great slave-trading regions of the continent, before, during, and after the white man arrived. It was Africans who enslaved their fellow Africans, selling some of these slaves to Europeans or to Arabs and keeping others for themselves. Even at the peak of the Atlantic slave trade, Africans retained more slaves for themselves than they sent to the Western Hemisphere. This pattern was not confined to West Africa, from which most slaves were sent to the Western Hemisphere. In East Africa, the Maasai were feared slave raiders, and other African tribes, either alone or in conjunction with Arabs, enslaved their more vulnerable neighbors. As late as 1891, it was reported that Manuema slavers had demoralized surrounding tribes, destroying crops, and famine reigned everywhere. Even in the early 20th century, Abyssinians were still raiding other Africans and carrying off slaves. It was 1922 before the British had gained sufficient control in Tanganyika to stamp out slavery there. Arabs were the leading slave raiders in East Africa, ranging over an area larger than all of Europe. The total number of slaves exported from East Africa during the 19th century has been estimated to be at least 2 million. Despite the impression created by Roots, during the era of the massive slave trade from West Africa, a white man was more likely to catch malaria in Africa than to catch slaves himself. The average life expectancy of a white man in the interior of sub-Saharan Africa at that time was less than one year. By and large, men from Europe or the Western Hemisphere came to the coasts of Africa, bought their slaves, and left as soon as possible. Even so, the death rates among the white crews of the ships carrying slaves to the Western Hemisphere were as high as the death rates among the slaves themselves. It was only much later, after quinine and other medical measures enabled Europeans to survive where there were tropical diseases, was it possible for them to invade Africa in force and establish empires there. But by then, the Atlantic slave trade had already been ended. During the era of that trade, Africa was largely ruled by Africans, who established the conditions under which slave sales took place. 
The crew of a slave ship was in no position to defy African rulers and their armies by going out across the land and capturing people willy-nilly. The stronger African peoples captured and enslaved the weaker peoples. The same pattern found over the centuries in Europe, Asia, the Western Hemisphere, and Polynesia. In the Asa land, the Ngoni and Yao swaggered over and terrorized other tribes. In Uganda, the Baganda made life miserable for their neighbors. And the Nioro and Hima of Anko enslaved Toro women and children. The Tutsi dominated the Hutu in Rwanda. The Maasai lorded it over the Kikuyu and Kamba. And the latter, in turn, held the Indorobo in a kind of serfdom. It was precisely the fact that Europeans, except for the Portuguese, seldom participated in the raids that captured and enslaved Africans that enabled most people in Europe and the Americas to remain oblivious to the traumatic experience that this was, with some Africans committing suicide to avoid capture and wives being whipped as they tried to cling to their husbands or children. Historian David Brian Davis pointed out that Europeans had little contact with the actual process of enslavement, and that as late as 1721, the Royal African Company asked its agents to investigate the modes of enslavement in the interior. Europeans typically saw only the end results, enslaved people being offered for sale on the coast. It was much the same story in the Ottoman Empire, where those who bought slaves had no idea what these slaves had been through before. Slavery was destroyed within the United States at staggering costs in blood and treasure, but the struggle was over within a few ghastly years of warfare. Nevertheless, the Civil War was the bloodiest war ever fought in the Western Hemisphere, and more Americans were killed in that war than in any other war in the country's history. But this was a highly atypical, indeed unique, way to end slavery. In most of the rest of the world, unremitting efforts to destroy the institution of slavery went on for more than a century, on a thousand shifting fronts, and in the face of determined and ingenious efforts to continue the trade in human beings. Within the British Empire, the abolition of slavery was accompanied by the payment of compensation to slave owners for what was legally the confiscation of their property. This cost the British government 20 million pounds, a huge sum in the 19th century, about 5% of the nation's annual output. A similar plan to have the federal government of the United States buy up the slaves and then set them free was proposed in Congress, but was never implemented. The costs of emancipating the millions of slaves in the United States would have been more than half the annual national output, but still less than the economic costs of the Civil War quite aside from the cost in blood and lives and a legacy of lasting bitterness in the South, growing out of its defeat and the widespread destruction it suffered during that conflict. While the British could simply abolish slavery in their Western Hemisphere colonies, they faced a more daunting and longer-lasting task of patrolling the Atlantic off the coast of Africa in order to prevent slave ships of various nationalities from continuing to supply slaves illegally. Even during the Napoleonic Wars, Britain continued to keep some of its warships on patrol off West Africa. Moreover, such patrols likewise tried to interdict the shipments of slaves from East Africa through the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf. Brazil capitulated to British demands that it end its slave trade after being publicly humiliated by British warships that seized and destroyed slave ships within Brazil's own waters. In 1873, two British cruisers appeared off the coast of Zanzibar and threatened to blockade the island unless the slave market there shut down. It was shut down. It would be hard to think of any other crusade pursued so relentlessly for so long by any nation at such mounting costs without any economic or other tangible benefit to itself. These costs included bribes paid to Spain and Portugal to get their cooperation with the effort to stop the international slave trade, and the costs of maintaining naval patrols and of resettling freed slaves, not to mention dangerous frictions with France and the United States, among other countries. Captains of British warships who detained vessels suspected of carrying slaves were legally liable if those vessels turned out to have no slaves on board the human costs were also large. The heavy drain, physical and mental, in keeping squadrons on the East African coast 
was reflected in the loss of 282 officers and men in the 10 years 1875 to 1885. And this did not include those invalidated home. Naval personnel, racked by fever, sunstroke, and dysentery, were forced to retire prematurely and live on a small pittance. The cost of upkeep of the squadron over the 20 years prior to 1890 was estimated at 4 million sterling, and this did not take into account the large amount of work imposed on consular and judicial staff in Zanzibar in trying cases and dealing with reports, etc. Even so, the results were slow in coming. More streamlined slave ships were designed in hopes of being able to outrun the ships of the Royal Navy in the Atlantic. Nevertheless, the dogged persistence of the British eventually reduced the shipment of slaves across the Atlantic and across the waters of the Islamic world. Although the French flag was for many years widely used as protection from the boarding of ships on the high seas by the British Navy, even by slave traders who were neither French nor authorized to fly the French flag, Eventually, France itself turned against slavery, outlawed the institution, and sent some of its own warships to patrol the Atlantic off the coast of Africa to intercept and deter the shipment of slaves to the Western Hemisphere. The American flag was likewise so used, and the United States, like France, eventually turned against the slave trade and sent warships to join the Atlantic patrols to interdict slave shipments. Although by 1860, the Atlantic slave trade had been effectively stopped, the slave trade from East Africa across the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf took longer to be reduced significantly. Off the east coast of Africa, smaller Arab vessels called dhows hugged the coastlines in waters too shallow for the British warships to enter. One British commodore estimated that he captured one dhow for every eight that escaped, Nevertheless, during the period from 1866 to 1869, 129 slave vessels were captured and 3,380 slaves were freed. When the threat of being boarded seemed imminent, the Arabs would throw slaves overboard to drown rather than have them be found on board, which could lead to British seizure of the vessel and punishment of those who manned it. The worst that could befall the slaves was when the slaver was overhauled by a British cruiser, and they might then be flung overboard to dispose of all evidence. Devereux mentions a case where the Arabs, when pursued by an English cruiser, cut the throats of 24 slaves and threw them overboard. Colombe also states that Arabs would not hesitate to knock slaves on the head and throw them overboard to avoid capture. Because there were only a few naval ships available to cover a vast expanse of water in this region, British warships would often launch smaller boats to engage the Arab slave dows. In these cases, as one study put it, the slave traffickers frequently did not hesitate to attack boat crews in defense of their profits. Battles between the Arabs' vessels and the smaller British craft were especially likely when the larger ships that launched them were too far away to reach the scene in time to join the battle. In other cases, the Arabs fled even from the smaller British vessels. An episode in 1866 was typical. On 26 April 1866, the Penguin set out after a dhow and fired several shots in an effort to make the crew come to. When the dhow failed to lower its sail, Gartorth felt certain that she was a slaver and ceased firing for the sake of the slaves on board. However, he managed to close with the dhow, which then made for the rocks through a heavy surf. By the time the ship's boats could be lowered to follow, the Arab crew had fled, but the pounding surf made any attempt by the slavers to salvage the human cargo too dangerous. To their horror, the boat crew found that they too could not reach the dhow, which was rapidly filling with water, drowning the slaves. The boat officer decided that he could not risk coming in close to the dhow, but several of the crewmen of the cutter recklessly dived in and swam through the surf to the dhow. In a remarkable display of courage, the sailors managed to bring 28 of the slaves back to the boat. But the dhow appeared to have had more than 200 slaves on board, and most died in the pounding waves. In another episode, the Arabs' ruthlessness toward the slaves was further revealed. When the Daphne's cutter captured a dhow with 156 slaves on board, many were found to be in the final stages of starvation and dysentery. One woman was brought out of the dhow with a month-old infant in her arms. The baby's forehead was crushed, 
and when she was asked how the injury had happened, she explained to the ship's interpreter that as the boat came alongside, the baby began to cry. One of the Dowmen, fearing that the sailors would hear the cries, picked up a stone and crushed the child's head. This was not a unique act. British missionary and explorer David Livingstone related a similar incident on land. One woman, who was unable to carry both her load and young child, had the child taken from her and saw its brains dashed out on a stone. Dr. Livingstone also reported having nightmares for weeks after encountering Arab slave traders and their victims. Not only was this Christian missionary shocked by the brutality of the Arab slave traders, so was Muhammad Ali, the ruler of Egypt, who was a battle-hardened military commander. None of this means that the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade should be ignored, downplayed, or excused, nor have they been. A vast literature has detailed the vile conditions under which slaves from Africa lived and died during their voyages to the Western Hemisphere. But the much less publicized slave trade to the Islamic countries had even higher mortality rates en route, as well as involving larger numbers of people over the centuries, even though the Atlantic slave trade had higher peaks while it lasted. By a variety of accounts, most of the slaves who were marched across the Sahara toward the Mediterranean died on the way. While these were mostly women and girls, the males faced a special danger, castration to produce the eunuchs in demand as harem attendants in the Islamic world. Because castration was forbidden by Islamic law, the operation tended to be performed, usually crudely, in the hinterlands, before the slave caravans reached places within the effective control of the Ottoman Empire. The great majority of those operated on died as a result, but the price of eunuchs was so much higher than the price of other slaves that the practice was still profitable on net balance. The British Governor-General of the Sudan, C.G. Gordon, estimated that between 1875 and 1879, from 80,000 to 100,000 slaves were exported through his region. General Gordon imposed the death penalty on those convicted of castrating slave men to market them as eunuchs. His attempt to stamp out slave trading in the Sudan cost him his own life as an opposing army, raised and led by Muhammad Mahad, defeated his troops at Khartoum in 1885 and killed Gordon, after which the slave trade flourished again. British control in the region was firmly re-established in 1898 by the crushing victory of troops led by Lord Kitchener at Omdurman, and including a young officer named Winston Churchill. On the issue of slavery, it was essentially Western civilization against the world. At the time, Western civilization had the power to prevail against all other civilizations. That is how and why slavery was destroyed as an institution in almost the whole world. But it did not happen all at once or even within a few decades. When the British finally stamped out slavery in Tanganyika in 1922, it was more than half a century after the Emancipation Proclamation in the United States, and vestiges of slavery still survived in parts of Africa into the 21st century. The unique position of the Western world in the history and especially the destruction of slavery, need not imply that there was unanimity within the West on this institution. In addition to whites who defended the enslavement of Africans on racial grounds, or who opposed general emancipation on social grounds, there were many whites, and even blacks, who defended slavery as a matter of self-interest as slave owners. Although most black owners of slaves in the United States were only nominal owners of members of their own families, there were thousands of other blacks in the antebellum South who were commercial slave owners, just like their white counterparts. An estimated one-third of the free persons of color in New Orleans were slave owners, and thousands of these slave owners volunteered to fight for the Confederacy during the Civil War. Black slave owners were even more common in the Caribbean. In short, there were many defenders of slavery in the West, even in the 19th century, and outside the West, slavery was too widely accepted to require defense. The Moral Dimensions of Slavery If slavery is not morally wrong, it is hard to imagine what else could possibly be wrong. 
Yet when Lincoln expressed this view, which was gaining currency in his time, it was a belief less than a century old in the West and still virtually non-existent outside the West. In ancient times, Aristotle had attempted to justify slavery, but many other Western and non-Western philosophers alike took it so much for granted that they felt no need to explain or justify it at all. Some Muslims regarded attempts to abolish slavery as impious, since the Quran itself accepted slavery as an institution, while trying to ameliorate the lot of the slave. Only in the American South did a large apologetic literature develop, seeking to justify slavery, because only there was slavery under such large-scale and sustained attacks on moral grounds as to require a response. While slavery was referred to in antebellum America as a peculiar institution, in an international perspective and in the long view of history, it was not this institution that was peculiar, but the principles of American freedom, with which slavery was in such obvious and irreconcilable conflict. If all men were created equal, as the Declaration of Independence proclaimed, then the only way to justify slavery was by depicting those enslaved as not fully men. A particularly virulent form of racism thus arose from a particularly desperate need to defend slavery against telling attacks that invoked the fundamental principles of the American Republic. Nowhere else in the world was slavery in such dire straits ideologically, and nowhere else did racism reach such heights, or depths, in defense of the institution. As a noted study of Brazil observed, the defenders of slavery on clearly racist grounds were as rare among public supporters of slavery in Brazil as they were common in the United States. Brazil was not a democracy, and so had no such ideological contradictions to overcome. In short, racism was neither necessary nor sufficient for slavery, whose origins antedated racism by centuries. Racism was a result, not a cause, of slavery, and not all societies that enslaved people of another race became pervaded with racism to the extent that the American South did. The stark contrast between the slave and the free, which made slavery a moral issue in the Western world in modern times, was simply not there for most societies and for most of history in most of the world. In hierarchical societies, where people were born into their stations in life, ranging through many gradations from royalty to bondage. Slavery was simply the bottom rung on a ladder based on the accident of birth, one notch below the serf, who was bought and sold with the land, instead of individually. This is not to say that being a slave was a matter of indifference. A horror of becoming a slave has been widespread around the world, but this is wholly different from a reluctance to enslave others. Christians, Muslims, and Jews all forbade the enslavement of their own respective fellow religionists, though they did not always honor even this ban, but all considered it permissible to enslave others. Clergy themselves had slaves, and both Christian monasteries in Europe and Buddhist monasteries in Asia owned slaves. Even Sir Thomas More's fictional ideal society, Utopia, had slavery. It was not until the late 18th century that there was even an intellectual movement, much less a political movement, for the abolition of slavery, and those in these movements were distinctly in the minority, even in the West, and had no counterparts outside the West. What was historically unusual was the emergence in the late 18th century of a strong moral sense that slavery was so wrong that Christians could not in good conscience enslave anyone or countenance the continuation of this institution among themselves or others. Nor was this view confined to religious leaders or congregations. Adam Smith in Britain and Montesquieu in France were among the secular intellectuals who wrote against slavery in the 18th century. Slavery was one of a number of long-standing institutions and traditions which were being questioned in the 18th century in the West. Before then, both secular and religious philosophers going back to Plato had seen the mundane physical world as being far less important than the ideal or spiritual world, so that being right and free in one's mind was more important than one's fate in the physical world. Dissipating one's energies trying to reform the practices of a sinful world was considered less important than bringing one's own soul into line with spiritual imperatives. To the religious, the world of the here and now was a transient thing, 
a prelude and a testing ground for the world that really mattered, the world of eternity. However, as a humanistic philosophy began to affect both secular and religious thought, what happened in the mundane physical world began to assume greater importance than it had before in the eyes of intellectuals, philosophers, and religious leaders. As the fate of human beings in the here and now loomed larger as a moral concern, the fate of slaves became part of the intellectual and moral agenda of the times. Over the centuries, established religious institutions in the West, notably the Catholic Church, but later including also established Protestant denominations, had made their peace with the institution of slavery as a fact of life and produced traditional rationales to reconcile it with the message of Christianity. Now these institutions, traditions, and rationales came under fire from within, as well as outside, the religious community across a broad front, of which slavery was just one battleground. Religious minorities, such as the Quakers or the Evangelicals within the Anglican Church, could not simply rely on religious tradition and authority because their very existence was based on a questioning of, and in some cases a break with, those traditions and authorities. These insurgents had to think independently about slavery, as about other things, and derive their own conclusions, as most people do not have to think through things which have been accepted facts of life for centuries. The rising class of secular intellectuals in the West could even less rely on the authority of established religious institutions. This did not mean that either secular or religious insurgents were automatically anti-slavery. What it meant was that they both had to evolve some intellectually and morally defensible position because they could not simply base themselves on existing beliefs or practices. Different individuals resolved the issues differently. But out of this process came some who began to see slavery as an intolerable evil. Quakers were the first religious group to find slavery morally intolerable, a threat to their own eternal salvation rather than simply a temporal misfortune of others. Yet even the Quakers did not arrive at this conclusion all at once. In the 17th and early 18th centuries, there were Quaker plantation owners in the West Indies and Quaker slave traders operating from London, Philadelphia, and Newport, Rhode Island. As late as 1705, most of the leaders of the Philadelphia Quakers owned slaves. However, as anti-slavery sentiment grew among the Quakers, slave ownership among these leaders declined to 10% by 1756. Then, just two years later, the Philadelphia Quakers banned the ownership of slaves by its members. In England as well, Quakers were the first to require members of their congregations to cease being slave owners. Evangelicals in the Anglican Church, notably William Wilberforce in Parliament, joined the Quakers and took the issue to the general public with a decades-long political struggle to get the British government to ban the trading of slaves. Only optimists thought this possible at the time, and even the leaders of the anti-slavery movement did not at first attempt the direct abolition of the institution of slavery itself, hoping instead that stopping the buying and selling of human beings would dry up the source and cause slavery as an institution to wither on the vine. At this juncture in history, Britain was the world's largest slave trader, and the powerful vested interests which this created were able to roundly defeat early attempts to get Parliament to ban the trade. In the long run, however, such powerful opposition to the proposed ban, combined with equal tenacity on the other side, simply dragged out the political struggle for decades, making ever wider circles of people aware of the issue, something that had never been a public issue before now became a subject of inescapable and heated controversy for years on end. Slavery could no longer be accepted as simply one of those facts of life that most people do not bother to think about. The long, drawn-out political controversy meant that more and more people had to think about it, and many who began to think about slavery turned against it. Eventually, such strong feelings were aroused among the British public that anti-slavery petitions with unprecedented numbers of signatures poured into Parliament from around the country, from people in all walks of life, until the mounting political pressures forced not only a banning of the international slave trade in 1808, but eventually swept the anti-slavery forces on beyond their original goals toward the direct abolition of the institution of slavery itself. Nor was this a transient phenomenon. 
For more than a century, these political forces were so unremitting that no British government of any party could ignore them. And even British politicians and colonial officials with no personal sense of a need to ban slavery were nevertheless forced further in that direction by political pressures. Not only were Britons forbidden to trade or hold slaves, the British Navy intercepted slave ships from other nations on the high seas, set the slaves free, and confiscated the ships. Only Britain's overwhelming power made this possible, and even then not against a powerful nation like France, but only extraordinary political pressures at home made it necessary. Moreover, this was a moral crusade continually fanned by reports from British missionaries in Africa and elsewhere, as well as by anti-slavery sentiments from other sources. Queen Victoria told Harriet Beecher Stowe that she had wept when she read Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yet one of the signs of our own times is that intellectuals have made desperate but futile efforts to depict the worldwide British anti-slavery crusade as somehow motivated by economic self-interest, rather than by the kinds of moral imperatives activating the kinds of people that today's intellectuals find hard to understand. At the time, however, John Stuart Mill said that the British, for the last half century, have spent annual sums equal to the revenue of a small kingdom in blockading the Africa coast, for a cause in which we not only had no interest, but which was contrary to our own pecuniary interest. While Britain spearheaded the anti-slavery movement in the world, the 19th century saw anti-slavery feelings spread until they became common throughout Western civilization, and only in Western civilization. By 1888, every country in the Western Hemisphere had abolished slavery, as had all European and European offshoot nations around the world. Yet attempts to abolish slavery in the non-Western world provoked armed uprisings within the Ottoman Empire. And elsewhere, peoples unable to directly mount challenges on the battlefield nevertheless engaged in massive evasions and concealments of their continued trade in human beings. After the open slave market in Istanbul was shut down, slaves continued to be smuggled in, often at night and in small groups, from the Caucasus and from around the Black Sea, among other places. Suppressing the slave trade across the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea was much harder and took much longer than suppressing the Atlantic slave trade. While slaves were transported across the Atlantic in large ships packed with their human cargoes, slaves were carried in smaller and more numerous vessels, along with rice, fish, and other merchandise, from East Africa to the Islamic world. British naval patrols were overwhelmed by the task of sorting out which of the innumerable Arab vessels were carrying slaves at a given time and place, and these patrols were never able to intercept more than a fraction of the slaves being shipped out of East Africa to the Islamic world of the Middle East and North Africa. Moreover, such success as the British had on the high seas led to a shifting of more of the slave trade to land, and especially to inland areas away from the ports and coastal outposts where British naval power could be exerted. With the passage of time, however, especially as other European powers began to adopt anti-slavery policies, not only for themselves, but for other nations that they conquered or influenced, the slave trade was forced to retreat further, though not to surrender. Moreover, the retreat of the slave trade did not mean the abolition of slavery itself. A number of European nations, as well as the United States, officially banned the international slave trade in the early 19th century, and treaties among them decades later provided various means of making the ban more effective. But while nations could deter other nations from slave trading, it was much more difficult to deter freelance pirates or freelance marauders on land from capturing and selling people wherever a vulnerable source of supply might exist. Thus, North African pirates raided the Mediterranean coast in the 16th and 17th centuries, while pirates in Asia raided islands in the Philippines and sold the people captured to buyers in Borneo, the Celebes, and other islands in the Pacific. The Spanish colonial authorities who controlled the Philippines organized resistance against these pirates, but it was not until the United States took over the Philippines in 1898 that slave raiding was stopped. In the French colony of Senegal, slavery itself was still thriving as late as 1904, though the slave trade had been reduced earlier. The Portuguese did not put an end to the slave trade in their colony in Guinea until just before the First World War, 
where European colonial military forces were spread thin and relied on indirect rule through indigenous authorities, as in much of Africa, local European colonial officials often found it expedient to turn a blind eye to the continued existence of slavery and the slave trade among the indigenous peoples, who saw nothing wrong with it and depended on it for a livelihood. However, this simply provided more fuel for exposés by European missionaries and journalists, leading eventually to still more pressure from the home governments to stamp out slavery. As one British historian put it, public opinion would not tolerate even vestigial slave trading in an area controlled by Britain. One sign of the difference between the history of slavery in Western and non-Western societies is the very different language used to describe the very different processes by which slavery was ended in these societies. For the European offshoot societies of the Western Hemisphere, the term was the abolition of slavery, while for Africa and the Middle East, the term was the decline of slavery a much more uneven and protracted process in which local peoples continued the practice whenever and wherever they could escape the scrutiny or the power of European imperial authorities. In Asia as well, slavery continued to exist in backwaters and hinterlands on into the early 20th century. Writing in the last decade of the 20th century, a scholar observed, Slavery in Southeast Asia is not a remote historical phenomenon. Laws certainly have prohibited private ownership of persons for a century or more. Yet in more hills and islands of the region, one still encounters people who admit to being slaves or the children of slaves. Even independent non-Western nations were pressured to end slavery, both directly and by a desire not to be embarrassed in the eyes of the world, meaning during the 19th century, mostly the powerful European world. In short, where European and European offshoot societies held direct and effective power in the 19th century, slavery was simply abolished. But where the Western world's power and influence were mediated, reduced, or otherwise operated only indirectly, their non-Western peoples were able to fight a long war of attrition and evasion in defense of slavery, a war which they had, however, largely lost by the middle of the 20th century but which they had not yet wholly lost even at the beginning of the third millennium, when vestiges of slavery remained in parts of Africa. Despite all this, those with an instrumental view of history have managed to turn things upside down and present slavery as an evil of our society, or of the white race, or of Western civilization. One could as well do the same with murder or cancer, simply by ignoring these evils in other societies and incessantly denouncing their presence in the West. Yet what was peculiar about the West was not that it participated in the worldwide evil of slavery, but that it later abolished that evil, not only in Western societies, but also in other societies subject to Western control or influence. This was possible only because the anti-slavery movement coincided with an era in which Western power and hegemony were at their zenith, so that it was essentially European imperialism which ended slavery. This idea might seem shocking, not because it does not fit the facts, but because it does not fit the prevailing vision of our time. Selective Moral Indignation Many who are selectively indignant about the immorality of slavery in American society or in Western civilization do not merely pass over in silence the larger-scale slavery in other parts of the world, but sometimes even attempt to apologize for the latter. The argument often used by apologists for slavery in the antebellum American South, that slaves were treated like members of the family, has often been uncritically accepted for African or Middle Eastern societies, though dismissed out of hand for slavery in the United States. Some of the forms of involuntary servitude in non-Western societies have even been said to not have been really slavery, though scholars have differed among themselves on the definition of a slave. The treatment of slaves has varied enormously, usually according to the kinds of work that slaves did. Around the world, plantation slaves have been almost universally treated worse than slaves used as domestic servants, for example. Given that plantation slavery was more common in the Western Hemisphere than in the Ottoman Empire, where slaves were more likely to be domestic servants, an argument could be made that the treatment of slaves in some societies was in general worse than in others, 
However, the high mortality rates and low reproduction rates of slaves in the Islamic countries should caution against accepting self-serving arguments that slaves were treated like members of the family in that part of the world, any more than in the American South. The absence of a critical literature or an anti-slavery movement outside the West left the abuses of slaves in non-Western countries without the kind of exposure or denunciation that such abuses provoked in European and European offshoot societies. Even so, terrible mortality rates were known to exist among slaves in Egyptian salt mines or among slaves in Iraq. For all the domestic slavery of Africa, there were also slave plantations in East Africa and on the island of Zanzibar, and some African and Asian slave owners used their slaves as human sacrifices in religious ceremonies, as did the Mayans in the Western Hemisphere. Europeans enslaved by North Africans were often used as galley slaves, which could be killing work. But slaves or former slaves in non-Western countries did not have an audience for stories of their oppressions comparable to that of slaves or former slaves in the United States, where the experiences of Frederick Douglass and other former slaves were widely publicized outside the South. The lone exception would be the narratives of European slaves in North Africa after they were ransomed or escaped back to Europe, or the stories told by the smaller number of Americans who were enslaved in North Africa and then rescued by the U.S. Navy in the early 19th century. But the audiences for their stories were in the West, not in the Islamic countries where they had been enslaved. Moreover, the stories of white slaves in the Islamic world were of interest only in the West of their time, not in the West of our time, when such experiences are largely passed over in silence, like other historical facts that do not fit today's visions and agendas. Direct observation of the treatment of slaves was less common with domestic slaves living behind walls or galley slaves hidden in the bowels of ships, as distinguished from plantation slaves working out in open fields. However, what was directly observable in the Islamic world were the slave caravans which marched vast numbers of human beings from their homes where they had been captured to the places where they would be sold, hundreds of miles away, often after spending months crossing the burning sands of the Sahara. The death toll on these marches exceeded even the horrific toll on packed slave ships crossing the Atlantic. Slaves who could not keep up with the caravans were abandoned in the desert and left to die a lingering death from heat, thirst, and hunger. Thousands of human skeletons were strewn along one Saharan slave route alone, mostly the skeletons of young women and girls, who were more in demand than men in much of the Islamic world. These skeletons tended to cluster in the vicinity of wells, suggesting their last desperate efforts to reach water. A letter from an Ottoman official in 1849 referred to 1,600 black slaves dying of thirst on their way to Libya. It has been estimated that, for every slave to reach Cairo alive, several died on the way. Whether or not the survivors were later treated better or worse than slaves in the Western Hemisphere after reaching their final destinations is by no means the whole story. While much of the history of the treatment of slaves has been presented as a history of the treatment of African slaves, the treatment of European slaves in North Africa and elsewhere was by no means benign. For example, this was the scene in 18th century Algiers as newly captured European slaves were paraded through town. Since the arrival of new slaves was a sign of prosperity and an occasion of civic pride for all the townsfolk, the resident Turks, Moors, Jews, and renegades all turned out to cheer and taunt the newcomers. Local children especially followed the slaves as they shuffled along, loudly humiliating them and sometimes threw refuse at them. The newly captured men's heads and beards were roughly shaved bare as part of the demoralization process to break their spirit, and slaves of either sex could be stripped naked for sale at auction. Most of the female slaves were used for domestic work, but the men tended to be used for work requiring strength, including the brutal and degrading work of galley slaves. When the ship was idle, slaves who needed to relieve themselves could make their way to the opening at the hull side of their bench, known as the borda dragging their part of the chain and presumably climbing over their sleeping companions. The only liberty that is given us in the galley, recalled Louis Marat, is to go to this place when we have occasion. This, however, many slaves were apparently too exhausted or dispirited to do and often ended up simply fouling themselves where they sat. The resulting stench, as many observers agreed, was beyond belief. But besides the fumes in which they labored, the shackled geati were also tormented by rats, fleas, bedbugs, and other parasites. 
In the middle of the 16th century, galleys propelled by the rowing of slaves were common in the Mediterranean, among both Europeans and their Islamic neighbors and enemies. In their epic naval battle of Lepanto in 1571, an estimated 80,000 rowers propelled the galleys of the warring powers, and these rowers were mostly slaves. The need for galley slaves later declined as Europeans first began to rely on sails for power, so that by the late 1600s, galley slaves were found primarily in vessels from North Africa and the Middle East. Later, as sails became more common on Mediterranean vessels from the Islamic countries as well, the hideous work of galley slaves also declined. While North African pirates enslaved Europeans primarily from the countries around the Mediterranean, they occasionally ranged much farther afield. Some of these pirates sailed into the English Channel and even into the Thames estuary. A 17th century British parliamentary report said, The fishermen are afraid to put to sea, and we are forced to keep continual watch on all our coasts. Nevertheless, Algerians were estimated to have captured more than 350 British ships between 1672 and 1682, which would mean that they enslaved a few hundred Britons annually. Earlier, in 1627, these pirates ranged even farther afield and raided Iceland, carrying off nearly 400 people into bondage. As late as the early 19th century, Barbary pirates captured American ships on the high seas and enslaved their crews. The phrase, to the shores of Tripoli, is in the U.S. Marine Corps hymn because Marines were part of a naval expedition sent to rescue hundreds of Americans from bondage in North Africa and serve as a warning against further pirate attacks on American ships. Not all the captured Europeans became slaves. Some were ransomed, as were Americans. After a successful raid on a European coast, the pirates sometimes sailed out of sight and then returned a day or two later under a white flag to offer to sell some of their captives back to their families. This was especially effective when the captives were children or youths who might be brought before their parents in the custody of a fearsome and leering moor to leave no doubt what awaited them in slavery, perhaps even before they arrived in Barbary. The story of how human beings treat other human beings when they have unbridled power over them is seldom a pretty story or even a decent story, regardless of the color of the people involved. When the roles were reversed, Africans did not treat Europeans any better than Europeans treated Africans. Neither can be exempted from moral condemnation applied to the other. Anachronistic Morality Moral principles may be timeless, but moral choices can be made only among the options actually available at particular times and places. By the time the existence of slavery became an issue in the Western world of the late 18th century, the question was no longer whether such an institution should have been created in the first place, but what to do, now that both the institution and millions of people brought from Africa by that institution were already inside Western societies, such as the newly created United States. It was possible to abolish the institution, but it was not possible to abolish the people. That simple, inescapable fact underlay the tangled and tortuous history of the issue of slavery in 19th century America, where circumstances made the moral issue more acute than in most other Western nations, while it was no moral issue at all outside the West. Deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites, Thomas Jefferson said, and 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained made the peaceful coexistence of these two large populations in the South unlikely in his judgment. More likely, he thought, were convulsions which will probably never end, but in the extermination of one or the other race. James Madison likewise referred to the repugnance of the whites to blacks, which he saw as founded on prejudices, themselves founded on physical distinctions, which are not likely soon, if ever, to be eradicated. Therefore, like many other opponents of slavery in their day, Jefferson and Madison saw emancipation as something that needed to be combined with expatriation in order to solve the problem of slavery without creating a bigger problem of a race war. The race war and bloodbath that erupted with the emancipation of blacks in Santo Domingo, today's Haiti, cast a long shadow over the South, and apprehensions were increased when Nat Turner's uprising in 1831 left a trail of death in Virginia before it was suppressed by lethal force. Many Americans of that era who saw slavery as evil saw a race war as a greater evil 
those who took this view had the most difficult moral choices to make and were most inclined to want to grope toward some plan that would ease slavery out of existence without consuming blacks and whites alike in mutually annihilating strife. The founders and early leaders of the American Republic, including Southerners like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison, saw slavery as an evil that could be tolerated only in fear of greater evils, and even then, not tolerated indefinitely. Among prominent Southerners of a later era, Robert E. Lee likewise declared in 1856 that he regarded slavery as an evil that he wished to see somehow gradually ended. Too often, the reductionism of a later age has turned all such hesitation about immediate emancipation into either rationalizations for continued economic exploitation or sheer hypocrisy. These charges need to be examined carefully, rather than being accepted or rejected a priori. Few who actually lived in antebellum America thought that slavery could be ended in the South by simple fiat, even though it was abolished that way without incident in most northern states. The situation was radically different in the two parts of the country. Slaves were only a relatively minor part of the northern population, and plantation slavery was virtually unknown, partly because the climate and soil did not lend themselves to the kinds of crops that could be grown efficiently on cotton plantations in the south or on sugar plantations in the Caribbean. Therefore, in the North, the question of abolishing slavery as an institution did not raise serious questions about what to do with the people who had been enslaved. Some affluent whites in the North lost their black household servants or rehired them as employees or sold them to the South, where slavery was still prevalent. But the relatively small numbers of people involved meant that it was not a major problem for the North in any case. Southerners faced a very different situation with momentous economic and social implications. Blacks were a much higher percentage of the total southern population than in the northern states, and in some places were an absolute majority. From the first census of 1790 to the last census before the Civil War in 1860, slaves were approximately one-third of the total southern population. As of 1860, slaves were more than 40% of the population of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and Louisiana and more than half the population of Mississippi and South Carolina, freeing in their midst millions of people of an alien race and unknown disposition and with no history in either Africa or America that would prepare them to be citizens of a society such as the United States was not an experiment that many were willing to risk in these states, not when it could mean risking their lives. Only those on opposite ends of a spectrum of opinion found the issue of slavery easy those like Senator John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, who wished to keep blacks enslaved indefinitely, and those like Massachusetts' William Lloyd Garrison, who advocated immediate emancipation of blacks with the full rights of citizenship. Ironically, both men reasoned on the basis of abstract principles, legalistic principles in the case of Calhoun, and moralistic principles in the case of Garrison. In both cases, the relentless march of their syllogisms left the painful human realities and dilemmas fading into the dim background. For the majority of Americans in between, neither option was acceptable, nor was any other option able to command a general consensus. The kind of strange cross-currents this situation generated were perhaps epitomized by the career of Congressman John Randolph of Virginia, a prominent and bitter opponent of the abolitionists, who nevertheless hated slavery. Slavery was to him a cancer, but one which must not be tampered with by quacks, who never saw the disease or the patient, for this could end in the race war that he too feared, threatening the life's blood of the little ones which are lying in their cradles in happy ignorance of what is passing around them, and not the white ones only, for shall not we too kill? Fears of a race war were not confined to Southerners, however, or even to Americans. Alexis de Tocqueville saw a race war in the South as a very real possibility in the wake of mass emancipation and one of many painful prospects created by the institution of slavery, especially a slavery in which the freed people and their descendants would be physically distinct and could not readily vanish by assimilation into the larger society, as in some earlier times and in other parts of the world. Moreover, slavery was a very poor preparation for freedom for blacks, economically, socially, or otherwise. Free blacks were already very disproportionately represented in prison populations, 
creating fears of what would happen if the much larger slave population were suddenly freed. Even a northern opponent of slavery like Frederick Law Olmsted, having encountered and been appalled by slave field hands during his travels through the South, feared that their presence in large numbers must be considered a dangerous circumstance to a civilized people. He urged charitable efforts toward blacks after they were freed, lest desperate want make them dangerous to those around them. But he too saw the freeing of millions of people unprepared for freedom as creating a serious danger to the society as a whole. Nor was Olmsted alone. Abolitionists were hated in the North as well as the South. William Lloyd Garrison narrowly escaped being lynched by a mob in Boston, even though there were no slaveholders in Massachusetts. And another abolitionist leader was killed by a mob in Illinois. Abolitionists were also targets of mobs in New York and Philadelphia, and anti-abolitionist rallies were held in many northern communities. None of this was based on any economic interest in the ownership of slaves in states where such ownership had been outlawed decades earlier. But just as Southerners resented dangers to themselves created by distant abolitionists, so Northerners resented dangers to the Union with the prospect of a bloody civil war. Even people who were openly opposed to slavery were often also opposed to the abolitionists. A leading historian of the Civil War era has called it a moot question whether even such leaders of the fight against slavery as Charles Sumner or Thaddeus Stevens could be called abolitionists in the sense in which the term was used at the time. Quakers, who had spearheaded the anti-slavery movement on both sides of the Atlantic, nevertheless distanced themselves from the abolitionist movement exemplified by Garrison. Abraham Lincoln, likewise, was never an abolitionist in the sense in which that word was used at the time, even though he publicly argued for an end to slavery for decades before he was in a position to put an end to it himself. When he first ran for president in 1860, abolitionists refused to support him, saying that the outcome of this election would make no difference whether success be to the Democrats or the Republicans. Accordingly, the abolitionists ran their own candidate for president, even though he had no realistic chance of being elected, and in fact split the anti-slavery vote, so that Lincoln was elected with only a plurality. Even after Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, the abolitionist movement split on whether to support him for re-election. Some abolitionists even criticized Frederick Douglass for purchasing his legal freedom, rather than continue to be in danger as a fugitive slave, because paying compensation for one's freedom was taken as a legitimization of slavery. It was the abolitionists' doctrinaire stances and heedless disregard of consequences, both of their policy and their rhetoric, which marginalized them, even in the North, and even among those who were seeking to find ways to phase out the institution of slavery, so as to free those being held in bondage without unleashing a war between the states or a war between the races. Garrison could say, the question of expedience has nothing to do with that of right, which is true in the abstract, but irrelevant in a world where consequences matter. Too often, the abolitionists were intolerant of those seeking the same goal of ending slavery when those others, including Lincoln, proceeded in ways that took account of the inescapable constraints of the times, instead of being oblivious to context and constraints. While the dilemmas created by slavery were particularly acute in the United States, similar considerations applied in some other Western societies. In 18th century Britain, Edmund Burke recognized the very same dilemmas for British colonies, such as those in the West Indies, and sought to devise ways around them. An opponent of the slave trade long before Parliament had been brought to that point by popular pressures, Burke put the problem, as he put so many other problems, in the context of the inherent constraints of circumstances, while seeing slavery as an incurable evil, Burke was concerned with what would happen to the slaves themselves after they were freed, as well as the implications of their freedom for the society around them. The minds of men being crippled by slavery, Burke said, we must precede the donation of freedom by developing in the enslaved people the capacity to function as responsible members of a free society. Therefore, he proposed the civilization and gradual manumission of Negroes in the two hemispheres. Later, he proposed to give property to the Negroes when they should become free. But nowhere did Burke view this as an abstract question without considering the social context and the consequences and dangers of that context. He rejected the idea that one could simply free the slaves by fiat as a matter of abstract principle, since he abhorred abstract principles on political issues in general, 
Thomas Jefferson likewise regarded emancipation, all by itself, as being more like abandonment than liberation for people whose habits have been formed in slavery. When Edmund Burke set forth his particular proposal to a colleague, he warned, Its whole value, if it has any, is the coherence and mutual dependency of parts in the scheme. Separately, they can be of little or no use. Burke's approach to slavery, as to other issues, was in terms of the actual context and the constraints implied by that context, not abstract principles. As he said on another issue, I do not enter into these metaphysical distinctions. I hate the very sound of them. In America, John Randolph of Roanoke took a similar position. I am not going to discuss the abstract question of liberty or slavery or any other abstract question. Today, slavery is too often discussed as an abstract question with an easy answer, leading to sweeping condemnations of those who did not reach that easy answer in their own time. In 19th century America especially, there was no alternative that was not traumatic, including both the continuation of slavery and the ending of it in the manner in which it was in fact ended by the Civil War, at a cost of one life for every six slaves freed. Many problems can be made simple but only by leaving out the complications which those in the midst of these problems cannot so easily escape with a turn of a phrase as those who look back on them in later centuries can. Even at the individual level, it was not always legally possible for a slave owner to simply set a slave free, for authorities had to approve in many states. When a motion was introduced into the Virginia House of Burgesses in 1769 to allow slave owners to free their slaves unilaterally, a motion seconded by Thomas Jefferson. There was anger at such a suggestion, and the motion was roundly defeated. An unlimited power to release slaves into the larger society was considered too dangerous to leave in private hands. Many who have dismissed the anti-slavery words of the founders of the American Republic as just rhetoric have not bothered to check the facts of history. Washington, Jefferson, and other founders did not just talk. They acted. Even when they acted within the political and legal constraints of their times, they acted repeatedly, sometimes winning and sometimes losing. One of the early battles that was lost was Jefferson's first draft of the Declaration of Independence, which criticized King George III for having enslaved Africans and for overriding colonial Virginia's attempt to ban slavery. The Continental Congress removed that phrase under pressure from representatives from the South. When Jefferson drafted a state constitution for Virginia in 1776, his draft included a clause prohibiting any more importation of slaves, and, in 1783, Jefferson included in a new draft of a Virginia constitution a proposal for gradual emancipation of slaves. He was defeated in both these efforts. On the national scene, Jefferson returned to the battle once again in 1784 proposing a law declaring slavery illegal in all western territories of the country as it existed at that time. Such a ban would have kept slavery out of Alabama and Mississippi. The bill lost by one vote, that of a legislator too sick to come and vote. Afterwards, Jefferson said that the fate of millions unborn was hanging on the tongue of one man, and heaven was silent in that awful moment. Three years later, however, Congress compromised by passing the Northwest Ordinance, making slavery illegal in the Upper Western Territories, while allowing it in the Lower Western Territories. Congress was later authorized to ban the African slave trade, and Jefferson, now president, urged that they use that authority to stop Americans from all further participation in those violations of human rights, which has been so long continued on the unoffending inhabitants of Africa. Congress followed his urging. As a historian summarized the actions of these early leaders, If the Founding Fathers had done none of this, if slavery had continued in the North and expanded into the Northwest, if millions of Africans had been imported to strengthen slavery in the Deep South, to consolidate it in New York and Illinois, to spread it to Kansas and to keep it in the Border South, if no free black population had developed in Delaware and Maryland, if no apology for slavery had left Southerners on shaky moral grounds, if, in short, Jefferson and his contemporaries had lifted nary a finger, everything would have been different. In short, the ideology of the American Revolution was not just words. Those ideas were not wholly without effect, even in the South, 
During the years immediately following creation of the United States, for a number of southern states eased legal restrictions on private manumissions during that era, and many blacks were freed voluntarily. As a leading historian of slavery in the United States noted, manumissions were in fact so common in the deeds and wills of the men of 76 that the number of colored freemen in the South exceeded 35,000 in 1790 and was nearly doubled in each of the next two decades. Despite growing apprehensions in the South following the bloodbaths in Santo Domingo, even as late as 1832, the Virginia legislature considered a bill to abolish slavery, though it was defeated by a vote of just 73 to 58. Nevertheless, resistance to general emancipation was far stronger in the South than in the North. Moreover, that resistance grew more intransigent after the Nat Turner Rebellion in 1831 and the rise of militant abolitionism in the North, exemplified by the founding of William Lloyd Garrison's fiery newspaper, The Liberator, that same year. Even the right of private manumission began to be severely restricted after the rise of the Northern abolitionist movement. The free black population, which had been growing faster than the slave population in the decades of large-scale private manumissions immediately following the American Revolution, now grew much more slowly than the slave population in the decades leading up to the Civil War. Southerners with a variety of views on the slavery issue were bitter against Northern abolitionists who were seen as imposing dangers on the South that the distant abolitionists themselves would never have to face. Out of this bitterness came a sectionalism and intolerance in the South that led, especially from the 1830s on, to suppression of criticisms of slavery in the region, including restrictions on academic freedom and freedom of the press, state censorship of the U.S. mails, and a campaign to stop sending Southern young men to Northern colleges. Ultimately, such fears, bitterness, and sectionalism led to secession and the ensuing civil war. Before things reached that point, however, there were many efforts, both individual and collective, in early 19th century America to find some way out of the dilemma in which many felt themselves trapped by decisions made before they were born. Indeed, decisions made before there was a United States. In colonial times, the colony of Georgia, for example, had tried to ban the introduction of slavery there, but was overruled in London. Quakers in colonial Pennsylvania had tried to put a high tax on the importation of slaves into that state, but this too was overruled by the British government. The fact that 19th century public opinion in both Britain and America was very different from what it had been two centuries earlier did not mean that either country could simply wipe the slate clean and escape the consequences of what had already been done in earlier times. Some Americans, including Washington, Jefferson, Jackson, and Lincoln, sought a way out of the painful dilemma by sending freed slaves back to Africa. However, by the time this idea became widespread, most of the slaves in the United States had never seen Africa, and neither had their grandparents. They spoke no African languages and had no idea where their forebears had originated, on a continent more than twice the size of Europe, and one where local and tribal origins were, and still are, crucial to one's acceptance or even toleration by other Africans. One concrete result of the Back to Africa movement was the establishment of the colony of Liberia on the West African coast, to which freed American blacks were sent during the administration of James Monroe, for whom they named their capital Monrovia. These first settlers were decimated by African diseases to which they no longer had biological resistance, which was just one of the problems of trying to undo the past. More fundamentally, the numbers that could realistically be transported to Africa for resettlement was less than the natural increase of the black population of the United States. So this was a foredoomed hope. Nevertheless, the American Colonization Society and many others persisted in the hope that slavery could be ended as an institution without releasing into American society millions of former slaves by establishing colonies for them in Africa or Haiti. Even when private manumissions of individual slaves was legally possible, it was not wholly without its dilemmas. Modern historian David Bryan Davis denounced Congressman John Randolph for hypocrisy because Randolph publicly condemned the slave trade during a visit to England, while he himself continued to hold slaves in the United States. However, Randolph was not just speaking for public consumption in England. He said similar things both in public and in private letters to friends in the United States. 
Why, then, did Randolph not simply free his own slaves? This question reaches beyond one man and has implications for the whole set of contradictions which slavery presented in a free society. At a personal level, the answer was clearest. Randolph could not simply free his own slaves legally, since he had inherited a mortgaged estate and the slaves were part of that estate. Only after he had removed both financial and legal encumbrances was freeing his slaves possible and only after he had made some provision for their economic viability as free people did he consider it humane. During hard economic times, Randolph wrote to a friend of more than 200 mouths looking up to me for food, and though it would be easy to rid myself of the burden, morally it would be more difficult to abandon them to the cruel fate to which our laws would consign them than to suffer with them. Thomas Jefferson likewise owned a plantation encumbered by debt, as did many other Southerners. So emancipation of all of Jefferson's slaves was never a real possibility, though he did manage to free nine of them. Like Burke and Randolph, Jefferson did not see slavery as an abstract issue. He saw the heavy moral stigma of slavery, but also the social dangers to flesh and blood people. He wrote in a letter, I can say with conscious truth that there is not a man on earth who would sacrifice more than I would to relieve us from this heavy reproach in any practicable way. The cession of that kind of property, for so it is misnamed, is a bagatelle, which would not cost me a second thought if in that way a general emancipation and expatriation could be effected. And gradually, and with due sacrifices, I think it might be. But as it is, we have the wolf by the ears, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale, and self-preservation in the other. Many other slave owners, of course, saw their slaves as simply a source of wealth, and were therefore determined to hold on to them for that reason. However, even those slaveholders with aversions to slavery in principle were constrained by a strong tradition of stewardship, in which the family inheritance was not theirs to dispose of in their own lifetime, but to pass on to others as it had been passed on to them. George Washington was one of those who had inherited slaves and, dying childless, freed his slaves in his will, effective on the death of his wife. His will also provided that slaves too old or too beset with bodily infirmities to take care of themselves should be taken care of by his estate, and that the children were to be taught to read and write, and trained for some useful occupation. His estate, in fact, continued to pay for the support of some freed slaves for decades after his death, in accordance with his will. The part of Washington's will dealing with slaves filled almost three pages, and the tone, as well as the length of it, showed his concerns. The Emancipation Clause stands out from the rest of Washington's will in the unique forcefulness of its language. Elsewhere in it, Washington used the standard legal expressions, I give and bequeath, it is my will and direction. In one instance, he politely wrote, By way of advice, I recommend to my executors. But the Emancipation Clause rings with the voice of command. It has the iron firmness of a field order. I do hereby expressly forbid the sale of any slave I may die possessed of, under any pretext whatsoever. Long before reaching this point in his personal life, George Washington had said of slavery as a national issue, There is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for the abolition of it. But like Burke, he saw a need for a plan of some sort, rather than simply freeing millions of slaves in a newly emerging nation surrounded by threatening powers, just as the freed slaves themselves would be surrounded by a hostile population. In short, the moral principle was easy, but figuring out how to apply it in practice was not. Moreover, in a country with an elected government, how the white population at large felt could not be ignored. When Washington congratulated Lafayette for the latter's purchase of a plantation where former slaves could live, he added, Would to God a like spirit would diffuse itself generally into the minds of the people of this country, but I despair of seeing it. He saw legislation as the only way to end slavery and said that a legislator who did that would get his vote. Slaves that Washington took north with him when he entered public life, he quietly left behind when he returned to Virginia after completing his terms as president, in effect freeing them on the sly, as one biographer put it. 
at a time when to free them officially could have set off controversies that neither he nor the new nation needed. George Washington was, after all, trying to hold together a fragile coalition of states bearing little resemblance to the world power that the United States would become in later centuries. As a slave owner in Virginia, Washington thought of ways he might sublet much of his estate, in which his current slaves might be hired by the year as laborers by tenant farmers. He was clearly casting about for some way, as he put it in a letter, to liberate a certain species of property which I possess very repugnantly to my own feelings. But there were no takers. Washington's behavior as a slave owner is also worth noting. Beginning in the early 1770s, he rarely bought a slave, and he would not sell one unless the slave consented, which never happened. Not selling slaves was an economic loss. Slave labor on a plantation with soil as poor as Mount Vernon brought in little or nothing. The only profit a man in his position would make was by selling slaves to states where agriculture was more flourishing. Washington would not. I am principled against selling Negroes as you would do cattle at a market. From 1775 until his death, the slave population at Mount Vernon more than doubled. As southern states in the 19th century began to tighten restrictions on the right of slave owners to free their slaves, in order to forestall the social problems that were widely feared, the laws made manumission increasingly difficult, legally complicated, and a costly process. Those slave owners who were prepared to grant manumission found it less onerous to let those who were legally their slaves simply live as de facto free persons. In antebellum Savannah, for example, two of the churches in the free black community there were headed by ministers who were among the most prosperous members of that community, even though they were, legally speaking, still slaves. Many blacks who had managed to gain freedom for themselves individually then legally owned members of their own families because it was not financially or otherwise feasible to go through what it would take to free them all de jour. Quakers also held legal titles to many slaves in their southern churches, while it was an open secret that these slaves lived free and independent lives. In the case of John Randolph, the charge of hypocrisy is hard to sustain in view of the events surrounding his death. Never married, and so without heirs to his estate, he made provision in his will, years before his death, that his slaves were to be not only freed, but provided with land in a free state on which they might hope to live in peace and be self-supporting. In a will written a dozen years before his death, Randolph wrote, I give and bequeath all my slaves their freedom, heartily regretting that I have ever been the owner of one. An earlier will said, I give my slaves their freedom to which my conscience tells me they are justly entitled. That this was said by a conservative white Southerner, a bitter political opponent of the abolitionists and a man who asserted the right of secession long before the Civil War, suggests something of the complexity of the issue confronting those who faced it directly as a human reality, rather than as an abstract question. Knowing the stringency of the laws of the South when it came to the freeing of slaves, when Randolph felt that he was dying, he summoned a doctor whom he wanted, ostensibly for medical treatment, but in fact as a white witness whose testimony would be accepted in the southern court as to his dying wishes. Once the doctor was present, Randolph ordered his black servant not to let the doctor leave the room until he, Randolph, was dead, so that there would be no legal question about what he had done. This was the scene. Randolph was propped up in the bed with pillows at his back, with his last remaining strength, eyes flashing, he pointed his long, bony index finger at the assembly. I confirm all the directions in my will respecting my slaves and direct them to be enforced, particularly in regard to a provision for their support. Raising his arm as high as he could, he brought it down with his hand open on Johnny's shoulder. Especially for this man. He then asked whether each of the witnesses understood him. Immediately, Randolph's keen, penetrating gaze clouded, his mind gave way, and he slumped down. Randolph's will provided money to purchase land for his freed slaves in a free state in order to give them a chance to be self-supporting as free people. But even in the free state of Ohio, the opposition of local whites made it impossible for them to live on the land he had provided. 
The racial animosity that he had feared from the beginning would blight their chances was rampant even in the North. Whatever the merits or demerits of Randolph's personal or public policy conclusions, hypocrite hardly seems the right word for him. Abstract moral decisions are much easier to make on paper or in a classroom in later centuries than in the midst of the dilemmas actually faced by those living in very different circumstances, including serious dangers. One way to understand the constraints of the times and their effects on public attitudes is to examine the difference between the way that many in 19th century America saw the slave trade as distinguished from the way that they saw slavery itself. If the institution of slavery and the presence of millions of slaves were facts of life, within which many decision-makers felt trapped by having inherited the consequences of decisions made by others in generations before them, the continuing trade in slaves, whether from Africa or within the United States, was a contemporary problem that was within their control. Thus, decades before slavery was abolished, the United States joined in the outlawing of the international slave trade. Even many Americans not yet ready to support the abolition of slavery as an institution nevertheless made the bringing of more slaves from Africa a capital offense in the United States. One of the few individuals whose appeal to President Abraham Lincoln for clemency was denied was a ship's captain named Nathaniel Gordon, who was hanged in 1862 after having been caught bringing slaves out of Africa. His ship was bound for Cuba, but was intercepted on the high seas by a warship of the American Navy because of the international ban on slave trading, even though slavery itself was still perfectly legal at the time in Africa, in Cuba, and in the United States. Clearly, the evil nature of slavery was recognized by the severe penalties imposed in America on those who continued to bring slaves from Africa though there was not yet a consensus on what to do about the millions of enslaved people already in the country. In the North, with all the hesitation in many matters, there existed unanimity in regard to the slave trade, according to W.E.B. Du Bois. Gordon's trial and execution were not even controversial and received little attention in the press. Even in the antebellum South, Virginia Congressman John Randolph again exemplified the cross-currents of the times in the dichotomy between the way that slave trading was seen and the way that slavery itself was seen. Although a fierce opponent of the abolitionists, Congressman Randolph was nevertheless adamant against slave trading, at home or abroad. Despite being a slave owner, Randolph did not engage in the practice of buying or selling slaves himself and denounced on the floor of the House of Representatives those hard-hearted masters who broke up black families by selling their members. Randolph urged the federal government to act in an area where it had legal jurisdiction to ban domestic slave trading in the District of Columbia. The fact that there was no such general support for making domestic slave trading a criminal offense as for making the international slave trade a capital offense reflected the fact that the former did not increase the total number of slaves in the United States, nor take any more people out of Africa. However, being a domestic slave trader was not without social stigma, even in the antebellum South. This moral distinction between slave trading and the continuation of slavery as an institution might be hard for some in later centuries to understand, because, in the abstract, there is no moral difference. Only in the concrete circumstances faced by the people of the times was there a practical social difference. The civil war that grew out of tensions over slavery was the bloodiest war ever fought in the Western Hemisphere and cost more American lives than any other war in the country's history. Whether or not those fighting on either side thought of their battles as being over slavery, as distinguished from secession, without slavery there would have been no secession and no civil war. The states that first seceded were states where slaves were the highest percentage of the population. Contemporary words and deeds by the leaders of the Confederacy made unmistakably clear that slavery was at the heart of their secession and at the heart of the Constitution that they established for their own new government. In later times, as slavery became ever more repugnant to people throughout Western civilization and even beyond, apologists for the South would stress other factors. But the real question is what factor moved Southern leaders when the fateful decision was made to secede, and that was unashamedly, as a Civil War historian put it, slavery. As for the race war that so many had feared, 
the fact that it did not materialize after emancipation is hardly decisive evidence that the fear was unfounded. During the Civil War, blacks were freed only where Union troops were in occupation of Southern territory, and an army of occupation remained in the South for more than a decade after the Civil War. In the antebellum era, no one on either side of the issue of slavery and emancipation had anticipated that. Even so, the vigilante violence of the Ku Klux Klan and other white terrorists, even while under military occupation, suggests that the potential for a race war was quite real. Among the other examples of anachronistic moral principles being applied in our own times to earlier times have been the many complaints that the Constitution of the United States did not abolish slavery. This was never a viable option because the South would not have remained united with the North if there had been such a clause. The clause would have been an empty symbolic gesture, leaving millions still enslaved in the South, but jeopardizing the existence of a vulnerable new country by splitting it in half at the outset. Even had both North and South survived as independent nations, slaves in the South were highly unlikely to have been freed by 1863, when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Would a meaningless clause have been worth the price of condemning even more generations of blacks to slavery? Moral principles cannot be separated from their consequences in a given context. Those preoccupied today with the contemporary instrumental use of history have scored many talking points by referring to the Constitution's allowance of additional representation for the South in Congress by counting three-fifths of the slave population in determining the number of congressmen to which the Southern states would be entitled. Like many political compromises, this one made no sense except as a means of obtaining agreement in a situation where a dangerous stalemate threatened. The talking point made today is that this political arrangement amounted to saying that a black man was only three-fifths as important as a white man. But would those who say this have preferred that the slave population have been counted as requiring the same representation in Congress as the free? What would have been the consequences? Or do consequences matter to those trying to score points? Since slaves had no voice whatsoever in the selection of Southern congressmen, counting the slave population at full strength would only have given white Southerners a stronger pro-slavery contingent in Congress. Scoring points today and being serious are two very different things. It should also be noted that the Constitution's distinction in counting people for representation in Congress was between slave and free, not black and white. Free blacks were counted the same as whites, and free blacks existed before the Constitution existed. Social Consequences in Different Societies The situation in the Islamic world was very different from that in the West. Despite the larger total numbers of slaves sent from Africa to the Islamic world over the centuries, the surviving African population in these countries was much less than the tens of millions in the Western Hemisphere. In addition to higher mortality rates of slaves en route to North African and Middle Eastern countries, the survival and reproduction rates of African slaves there were much less than in the United States. While slaves in the antebellum South lived in families, even though they lacked official legal sanction for their marriages, both marriage and casual sex among slaves were suppressed in the Islamic world, and among the relatively small numbers of children born to African slaves there, the mortality rate was so high that few lived to adulthood. The sex imbalance among African slaves, far more women than men in the Islamic countries, and the fact that eunuchs were common among the relatively few African men, likewise precluded a vast African slave population in the Muslim countries. Among the European galley slaves in North Africa, there was even less chance for them to reproduce, and the European women who were domestic servants or concubines were in no position to leave behind European offspring raised in a European culture. The children born to them fathered by North African or Middle Eastern slave owners, were absorbed both biologically and culturally into the Islamic world. By the late 18th century, visitors were commenting on the lighter complexions of the inhabitants of Algiers. What the United States had that the Islamic world did not have was a self-sustaining and racially distinct population of major proportions within the larger society. Non-Western countries in general faced neither the social nor the moral dilemmas that confronted 19th century Americans. Moreover, the emancipation of slaves was not an issue faced by non-Western societies, but rather was something imposed on them by the West. 
Even European powers with substantial slave populations in their Western Hemisphere colonies faced no major domestic social consequences from the freeing of those slaves, however much that might have economic repercussions, for their slaves were freed on the other side of the ocean. Both slavery and emancipation were peculiar in their consequences on American soil. It may be significant that the only other independent nation in the Western Hemisphere with a large slave population, Brazil, was the last Western nation to abolish the institution, a quarter of a century after the United States. The Legacy of Slavery Slavery has left many legacies, some economic, some social, some psychological, some political, and most detrimental. Economics Those who think of slavery in economic terms often assume that it is a means by which a society, or at least its non-slave population, becomes richer. Some have even claimed that the Industrial Revolution in Western civilization was based on the profits extracted from the exploitation of slaves. Rather than rehash a large and controversial literature on this issue, we may instead look at the economic condition of countries or regions that used vast numbers of slaves in the past. Both in Brazil and in the United States, the countries with the two largest slave populations in the Western Hemisphere, the end of slavery found the regions in which slaves had been concentrated poorer than other regions of these same countries. For the United States, a case could be made that this was due to the Civil War, which did so much damage to the South, but no such explanation would apply to Brazil, which fought no civil war over this issue. Moreover, even in the United States, the South lagged behind the North in many ways, even before the Civil War. Although slavery in Europe died out before it was abolished in the Western Hemisphere, as late as 1776, slavery had not yet died out all across the continent when Adam Smith wrote in The Wealth of Nations that it still existed in some eastern regions. But even then, eastern Europe was much poorer than western Europe. The slavery of North Africa and the Middle East over the centuries took more slaves from sub-Saharan Africa than the Western Hemisphere did, in addition to large imports of slaves from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe to the Muslim countries of North Africa and the Middle East. But these remained largely poor countries until the discovery and extraction of their vast oil deposits. In many parts of the non-Western world, slaves were sources of domestic amenities and means of displaying wealth with an impressive retinue, rather than sources of wealth. Often, they were a drain on the wealth already possessed, According to a scholarly study of slavery in China, the slaves there did not generate any surplus, they consumed it. Another study concluded, the Middle East and the Arab world rarely used slaves for productive activities. Even though some slave owners, those whose slaves produced commercial crops or other saleable products, received wealth from the fruits of the unpaid labor of these slaves, that is very different from saying that the society as a whole or even its non-slave population as a whole, ended up wealthier than it would have been in the absence of slavery. Not only in societies where slaves were more often consumers than producers of wealth, but even in societies where commercial slavery was predominant, this did not automatically translate into enduring wealth. Unlike a frugal capitalist class, such as created the Industrial Revolution, even commercial slave owners in the American antebellum South tended to spend lavishly often ending up in debt or even losing their plantations to foreclosures by creditors. However, even if British slave owners had saved and invested all of their profits from slavery, it would have amounted to less than 2% of British domestic investment. In the United States, it is doubtful whether the profits of slavery would have covered the enormous costs of the Civil War, a war that was fought over the immediate issue of secession, but the reason for the secession was to safeguard slavery from the growing anti-slavery sentiment outside the South, symbolized by the election of Abraham Lincoln. Brazil, which had several times as many slaves as the United States, and perhaps consumed more slaves than any other nation in history, was nevertheless still a relatively undeveloped country when slavery ended there in 1888. And its subsequent economic development was largely the work of immigrants from Europe and Japan. In short, 
Even though some individual slave owners grew rich and some family fortunes were founded on the exploitation of slaves, that is very different from saying that the whole society, or even its non-slave population as a whole, was more economically advanced than it would have been in the absence of slavery. What this means is that whether employed as domestic servants or producing crops or other goods, Millions suffered exploitation and dehumanization for no higher purpose than the transient aggrandizement of slave owners. Social and Psychological Legacies of Slavery Just as enslaved peoples tend to be despised, so the work done by slaves tended to acquire social stigmas in countries around the world. In Java, for example, free people did not want to carry their own packages, since slaves carried packages and therefore free people without slaves would hire a slave for such chores. Similarly, in Egypt, work done by slaves was spurned by working-class people, even after slavery was over. Sometimes it was not just particular kinds of work, but hard work in general, or work under the direction of a foreman or overseer that was stigmatized. Just as great conquerors like the Mongols or the Spaniards disdained commerce as beneath them, So ordinary people in slave societies disdained many kinds of work because it had been done by slaves. One consequence of this was that immigrants with a work ethic, such as Italian immigrants to Brazil and Argentina, who often entered such societies much poorer than the existing white populations of these countries, began at the bottom by working at many tasks that local whites disdained, and ultimately rose to a higher economic plane than the whites who had been born there. Whatever their initial disadvantages, the immigrants were not burdened with the native-born whites' aversions to work. Former slaves and the descendants of slaves likewise developed aversions to tasks performed under slavery. In the British West Indies, for example, blacks, after emancipation, left the plantations in such numbers that a whole new plantation workforce had to be imported from India to replace them. The economic costs of such attitudes, deriving from slavery and continuing for generations thereafter, cannot be quantified, but also cannot be dismissed as negligible. Where slaves and slave owners have been of visibly different races, then the racial animosities and distrust deriving from the era of slavery may also last for many generations after slavery itself is over leading to economic and psychic costs to individuals as well as social costs to nations. Although the negative economic consequences of slavery, including consequences among generations born long after slavery itself was ended, cannot be quantified, the patterns of lasting economic lags in regions where slavery was widespread may nevertheless be suggestive. In the United States, and no doubt some other societies, One of the major psychological legacies of slavery has been a sense of shame and resentment among the black population and a sense of guilt among the white population. The reiterated depiction of enslavement as a peculiarly black experience falsely makes this seem to be a uniquely shameful fate to which a particular race submitted, requiring for some of their descendants compensatory bombast from themselves and, if possible, compensatory benefits to be extracted from others. To whites, the false depiction of the history of slavery makes some feel uniquely guilty and responsible for the current misfortunes of blacks. Such attitudes, and the many cross-currents they generate, are hardly the framework for a rational discussion or resolution of today's social issues. The physical and psychic sufferings of slaves in the past are neither necessary nor sufficient to explain the economic and other differences between their present-day descendants and members of the general population the economic and other disparities between Europeans and Africans living, respectively, in Europe and Africa are vastly greater than the disparities between the descendants of Europeans and Africans living in the United States. The latter have not lost but gained economically from living in the United States. That these gains derive from the tragic fate of their ancestors does not make them any less gains, over and above where these descendants would be today if their ancestors had been left alone in peace in their homeland. This cannot morally justify the seizing of their ancestors. It simply affects the cause and effect question of the reasons for black-white disparities today. Often, the economic lags or social pathology of American blacks have been blamed on a legacy of slavery 
whether it is the dearth of marriages and families among contemporary blacks or their lower labor force participation than whites or their high crime rates, slavery has often been invoked as an explanation. Yet the fact is that in the late 19th century, when blacks were just one generation out of slavery, there was nothing like today's level of unwed births or failure to participate in the labor force. It has been from the 1960s onward that these social pathologies have escalated. Whatever the cause, it has risen long after slavery had ended. Two very different questions have been confused as regards the history of black families. One, why marriage rates differ between blacks and whites. And two, why marriage rates among blacks are much lower now than in the past. Official census data show that blacks had slightly higher marriage rates than whites for every census from 1890 to 1940, but far lower marriage rates than whites by 1960. On the black-white difference, some have argued that the census data from the late 19th and early 20th centuries are misleading, that black unmarried women with children in that era called themselves widows to avoid the embarrassment of being unwed mothers even though the mortality rate among black men was not enough to account for so many widows. Interestingly enough, those who argued this way offered no explanation for the high rate of marriage among black men during that same era, since unmarried fathers were unlikely to have children living with them to require them to pretend to be married when they were not. As of 1940, for example, from 66 to 70 percent of non-white males in age brackets from 30 and up reported themselves in the census as married and living with a spouse. Adding those black males who were widowers, separated or divorced, more than three-quarters of black males had been married, despite being only the third generation after slavery. However one resolves the question of the black-white differences in rates of married and unwed motherhood, the more fundamental question as regards the legacy of slavery argument is why black marriage rates began a precipitous decline in 1960, nearly a century after the end of slavery. While the percentage of first births that were premarital has long differed as between blacks and whites, as it differed between antebellum white southerners and white northerners, and between other groups around the world in places where slavery cannot be invoked as an explanation, the sharp increase in premarital first births among blacks began in the 1960s. From 1930 to 1934, 31% of first births to black women were premarital, while from 1990 to 1994, 77% were. Moreover, whereas in 1930 to 1934, premarital births plus the births of children conceived before marriage but born after marriage were together still a minority in all black births. By 1994, these two categories constituted 86% of all black births. That such a legacy of slavery would take nearly a century to appear strains credulity. Summary and Implications The history of slavery can be looked at from several perspectives or for several purposes. Whether slavery is examined morally, causally, or politically is a matter of individual choice. But once that choice is made, accuracy and consistency are crucial. Moral judgments must be made with the facts as they are or were and applied consistently, regardless of the race, nationality, or religion of either the enslavers or the enslaved. These facts include the social context and the constraints and consequences implied by that context. We cannot assume 21st century options or even present-day knowledge when judging decisions made in the 19th century. Nor can we assume that we have superior knowledge of the social realities of an earlier era that we never lived through compared to the first-hand knowledge of those who confronted those realities daily and inescapably. Moral questions about slavery have been almost exclusively Western moral questions. Non-Western societies had neither moral concerns about slavery nor, in most cases, the power to decide on the continuance or extinction of the institution for themselves during the era of European imperialism, when slavery was suppressed over most of the world by the West. Not only has the West's crucial role in the destruction of slavery around the world gone largely unnoticed, standards applied almost exclusively to the West have been used to condemn European and European offshoot societies for having once had slavery.
Even those Western leaders who sought to end slavery are condemned by critics today for not having done it sooner or faster. The dangers and constraints of their times have too often been either ignored or brushed aside as mere excuses, as if elected leaders operating under constitutional law could simply decree whatever they felt was right. Even a sympathetic biography of George Washington, for example, said, He had helped to create a new world, but had allowed into it an infection that he feared would eventually destroy it. This statement is breathtaking in its assumptions. Washington did not allow slavery, which existed on American soil and around the world before he was born, nor did he have the option to decree its end. Even to have made slavery a public issue at the time would have accomplished nothing except to jeopardize the survival of a fragile coalition of newly independent states. Yet, this man, who contributed more than anyone else to the introduction of free Republican government in the modern world, is widely seen as being under a moral cloud, as if he had chosen to introduce or abet slavery. Washington's actual behavior illustrated what Adam Smith had said decades earlier in his theory of moral sentiments, that a man prompted by humanity and benevolence, when he cannot establish the right, will not disdain to ameliorate the wrong. Abraham Lincoln, who took advantage of a military conflict to stretch his powers as commander-in-chief to the point of issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, has been downgraded in the post-1960s world for not having done it sooner, more sweepingly, with more fervent moral rhetoric, and with affirmations of the equality of the races thrown in. The serious legal and political risks that Lincoln took when he emancipated Southern slaves are ignored. There was no groundswell of public opinion, even in the North, for freeing slaves. On the contrary, in a war-weary nation, it was feared that the Emancipation Proclamation would stiffen Southern resistance and reduce the chances of an early negotiated settlement of a conflict that killed more Americans than any other war before or since. Lincoln himself was unsure what the net military effect of the proclamation would be. Yet, military necessity was the only rationale that had either a constitutional basis or a political chance of being accepted. Those in later times who judge only by words may be disappointed that Lincoln did not make a ringing moral case for emancipation. But seldom, if ever, do they ask whether they would have made the proclamation more likely or less likely to survive both constitutional and political challenges. Despite Lincoln's mastery of moral rhetoric, some consider his Gettysburg Address the finest speech in the English language. The Emancipation Proclamation was written in such dry and dull language that it has been likened to a bill of lading. But Lincoln understood that ringing rhetoric can be as counterproductive in some situations as it is inspiring in others. To have made the moral case for emancipation in the proclamation would have undermined its acceptance as a matter of military necessity. The earlier emancipation of slaves in the British Empire likewise invoked military necessity and avoided ringing humanitarian rhetoric in order to maximize the range of its political support. As a distinguished scholar aptly put it, we are so conditioned to expecting interest to masquerade as altruism that we may miss altruism when concealed beneath the cloak of interest. As it was, Lincoln was viciously attacked in the Democrats' press for issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Nor was this simply a question of his own political career being in jeopardy. Lincoln warned Andrew Johnson to remember that it cannot be known who is next to occupy the position I now hold, nor what he will do, at this critical moment in the history of the nation and of the fight against slavery. William Lloyd Garrison could indulge in ringing rhetoric without regard to the consequences, but Abraham Lincoln had the heavy responsibility of consequences squarely on his shoulders as he faced his countrymen and history. Lincoln had been elected to his first term by a plurality rather than a majority, and it was by no means certain that he would be re-elected, especially with the controversy over the Emancipation Proclamation swirling around him. Those who view slavery as an abstract moral issue are as disappointed with Lincoln today as William Lloyd Garrison was at the time. Garrison was dissatisfied with the language of the Emancipation Proclamation and with the fact that it did not decree the total abolition of slavery, rather than just its abolition in the southern states at war. He seemed oblivious to the huge legal and political risks that Lincoln was taking, as many in later times would be when they criticized the limits of his actions and words. 
But had Lincoln's real concerns extended no further than the military effects of the Emancipation Proclamation, it would be hard to explain his many and strenuous behind-the-scenes efforts to get slaveholding border states and the Congress of the United States to extend the ban on slavery to the whole country. Garrison's rhetoric may look better to a later generation, but the cold fact is that William Lloyd Garrison did not free a single slave, while Abraham Lincoln freed millions. Lack of awareness or concern for the context and constraints of the times is only part of the problem of those today assessing such historic figures as Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln, or the American nation as a whole. No small part of the distortion and confusion about the history of slavery comes from attempts at scoring points about the past or using the past to extract concessions or largesse in the present. Non-Western slaveholding countries, past and present, from whom no reparations or other concessions are even remotely to be expected, are passed over in silence by the most vocal critics of the West. Scholars have long known that slavery was a worldwide institution, going back thousands of years, though that has not led them to provide comparable coverage to slavery outside of Western civilization. One scholar whose study of slavery encompassed Islamic as well as Western countries observed, Slavery has been a common feature of human history, appearing in nearly every part of the world. Though his own study did not extend across the vast reaches of Asia or to the Polynesian islands, another scholar distinguished for his studies of the Atlantic slave trade declared, Slavery until recently was universal in two senses. Most settled societies incorporated the institution into their social structures, and few peoples in the world have not constituted a major source of slaves at one time or another. Despite such common knowledge among scholars, the version of the history of slavery more commonly depicted to the general public, as well as to students in our schools and colleges, is more along the lines of roots or other similar productions. On the other end of the spectrum, one of the rationales for slavery used in both ancient times and in more recent centuries has been that consigning some people to perform the drudgery of the world freed others to pursue the higher things, education, invention, political leadership, the arts, etc., and thus advance civilization as a whole. Plato and Socrates came out of a slaveholding society, as did many of the remarkable leaders who founded the American Republic. But correlation is not causation, and even the correlation is not as clear as some apologists for slavery have assumed. Although Brazil imported several times as many slaves as the United States, it would be difficult to find Brazilian equivalents of Plato or Socrates or other world leaders in the advancement of civilization in the arts or sciences. The remarkable number of early American leaders who came out of Virginia, including Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, had no counterparts in other southern states, which collectively had vastly larger numbers of slaves than those of Virginia. The South as a whole lagged far behind the North in producing leaders in the arts and sciences. Slavery has been too facile an explanation of both the positive and negative aspects of slaveholding societies. The idea that slavery was based on race or racism is yet another popular notion that will not stand up to a scrutiny of history, as we have already seen. Yet, beliefs about the innate ability of blacks in the United States by prominent American leaders of an earlier era have been invested with great moral implications by those seeking to score points. But beliefs are neither moral nor immoral. They may be accurate or inaccurate, founded or unfounded. But they acquire moral significance only when they are shaped to serve some ulterior purpose that is either moral or immoral. Belief in the innate equality of all people has been promoted in order to promote equal treatment of all people, and belief in innate inferiority has been promoted in order to justify discrimination against some people, but it is these goals which have moral significance. In the absence of such goals, the beliefs themselves are subject to the tests of evidence and logic, rather than the test of moral principles. Abraham Lincoln, for example, said of blacks that their abilities were no measure of their rights. Thomas Jefferson likewise said, Be assured that no person living wishes more sincerely than I do to see a complete refutation of the doubts I have myself entertained and expressed on the grade of understanding allotted to them by nature, and to find that in this respect they are on par with ourselves. <laughs> 
My doubts were the result of personal observation on the limited sphere of my own state, where the opportunities for the development of their genius were not favorable, and those of exercising it still less so. I expressed them, therefore, with great hesitation. But whatever their degree of talent, it is no measure of their rights. Because Sir Isaac Newton was superior to others in understanding, he was not, therefore, lord of the person or property of others. That took the question of Jefferson's beliefs about the innate ability of blacks out of the realm of morality. Elsewhere, Jefferson pointed out how tentative any conclusion must be about the innate ability of blacks, given the lack of scientific precision possible on such questions. Although Jefferson has been criticized for having expressed doubts, what he called a suspicion only, about the innate ability of black people, his obvious pleasure at discovering the able work of Benjamin Banneker suggests that his beliefs were not the servant of some ulterior purpose. The vast majority of blacks that Thomas Jefferson saw were illiterate people whose development had been stunted by slavery. He never in his entire life saw a black American who had a college degree, because there were none. The first black man to receive a college degree in the United States did so two years after Jefferson's death, and the first black woman more than a quarter of a century after that. As Jefferson himself realized, his observed sample of black people was inherently biased by time and place, which is an empirical deficiency of his circumstances, rather than a moral choice of his own. Others, however, used their belief that blacks were innately lacking in ability to justify, for example, forbidding the teaching of blacks. Frederick Law Olmsted's response to the claim that blacks were no more capable of being educated than animals were was to ask why there were no laws forbidding animals from being educated. The very need for such a law undermined the belief that was used to justify that law. Again, the moral significance of a belief derives from the purpose to which it is put. Otherwise, there is only a question of assessing the logic and evidence behind the belief. While facts about slavery are essential, we need more than facts. Indeed, one of the principal uses of facts is to gain some sense of causation, some explanation of why history unfolded as it did. In the case of slavery, it has been too readily assumed that resistance to emancipation in 19th century America was based simply on the economic interests of those who owned slaves, when in fact abolitionists were hated even in states that had outlawed slavery, and emancipation was feared even by white Southerners who owned no slaves who were a majority of white Southerners. When slavery is viewed in worldwide perspective, still more common beliefs crumble when confronted with the facts of history. The truth should need no apology, but the truth about the history of slavery is urgently needed for reasons that go beyond historical accuracy. Both the present and the future are at stake when we look at the past. What lessons we draw from that past depend on whether it is viewed narrowly or against the broader background of world history. From a narrow perspective, the lesson that some draw from the history of slavery, automatically conceived of as the enslavement of blacks by whites, is that white people were, or are, uniquely evil. Against the broader background of world history, however, a very different lesson might be that no people of any color can be trusted with unbridled power over any other people, for such power has been grossly abused by whatever race, class, or political authority has held that power, whether under ancient despotism or modern totalitarianism, as well as under serfdom, slavery, or other forms of oppression. It was not because people thought slavery was right that it persisted for thousands of years. It persisted, largely, because people did not think about the rightness or wrongness of it at all. In very hierarchical societies, where most people were born into their predetermined niches in the social complex, slaves were simply at the bottom of a long continuum of varying levels of subordination based on birth. Even in colonial America, white indentured servants were a major part of the population, and they were auctioned off just like black slaves. It was the rise of modern free societies and their accompanying ideologies in the West which made slavery stand out in stark contrast. And it was the emergence of a general questioning of institutions and beliefs in the 18th century, also in the West, that brought slavery into question. Once that happened, 
slavery could not stand up under moral scrutiny. Outside the West, it did not have to, at least not until after the spread of Western ideas of individual freedom belatedly took hold in some other societies. That such an institution could last so long unchallenged on every inhabited continent is a chilling example of what can happen when people simply do not think.